This morning we'll be reading from the New Testament book of Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through, I know your bulletin says 28, but we're only going to read through 27 today, verses 15 through 27, found on page 1165 in your pew Bibles if you'd like to follow along. Colossians 1 verses 15 through 27. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from, alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, If you continue in your faith, established and firmed, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the word of the Lord. For those of you who grew up in the Presbyterian or perhaps the Reformed tradition, you might be familiar with something called the Westminster Catechism. A catechism is really nothing but a a series of teachings uh, meant for those who follow in a a certain tradition. But this is the first question found in the Westminster Catechism, sometimes also the Westminster Confession. What is the chief end of man? In other words, what is the purpose of a human being? That's quite a profound question to think about as starting off a series of teachings. It's starting off a catechism. Even if you didn't grow up in the tradition that used the the Westminster Catechism, have you ever thought about this question? What is the chief end of man? What is the purpose of a human being? I think it's safe to say that many people have no idea what the chief end of man is. Perhaps some people would answer by saying that the chief end of man is to be happy. Because after all, doesn't everyone want to be happy in this life? Whatever happy means, right? Isn't happiness the ultimate goal of anything and everything that we do? Perhaps others might say that the chief end of man is to experience as much as this world has to to offer because what is life except experiences? Others might offer different possible answers to this question, but what does the Westminster Catechism say is the answer? What is the chief end of man? The answer it gives is this. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Is that the answer that you would have come up with? The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So where does the catechism get that idea? Well, here are the scriptures that it cites as references to this notion. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Romans eleven thirty six. For him and For him and through him and for him all things exist. To him be the glory forever. Amen. John 17, 22 and 24. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of this world. And finally, Psalm 73, 
24 through 26. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What is the chief end of man to glorify God and to enjoy him forever? I think this question and answer from the Westminster Catechism holds a great deal of truth. But perhaps some people might take issue with it. I mean, really, is that what life is supposed to be all about? Does everything we do really need to be done with the primary purpose of glorifying God? Surely there must be some aspects of life that are done solely for our benefit and just for our enjoyment, isn't there? But I think the scriptures the catechism use are clear without breaking down every single action and analyzing it, trying to figure out if, if whether or not we are actually doing the will of God. I think the general idea is that we were made to be in a relationship with God. As Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created, as the King James Version of the Bible says. For God's pleasure, he created all things. In other words, the teaching of Scripture is that you were created by and for God. And because you were, we were, Ultimately, our happiness, our self-worth, our identities, our, our, our purposes are intimately bound up with a relationship with God, which is why Paul can say, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. It is precisely in living for God where we find the kind of happiness and the joy that this life has to offer. And it's with this understanding in mind that we can look at what Paul says here to the Colossian church. It was a teaching that began to creep into the church that really kind of began to question and to doubt Jesus' identity. A teaching that questioned whether Jesus was actually God or maybe something else. Maybe he fell somewhere in between a human being and God, somewhere in this area here, but I don't think he was God. Or if he was God, maybe he was one God among many gods, just another one. A higher being, Jesus is, this teaching said, but... You know, he, he's not who the Gospels proclaim him to be. And Paul is addressing this teaching in order to try to, to try to reground the church on this foundational truth of the Christian faith. Now, what he says may come as a surprise to some of you who have never considered this uh, aspect of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the first thing that Paul points out is, is simply this. The Lord Jesus is the creator, the sustainer, and the goal of every created being. How many of us associate the person of Jesus Christ with Genesis 1-1? You ever do that? I think many people know of uh, something that we call, in technical terms, a theophany. These are just what we call pre-incarnate appearances of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. We uh, saw that a little bit when we studied the book of Daniel. But exactly how Jesus fits into the divine scheme of the Old Testament has always been a little bit of a mystery for many of us. Well, Paul takes that mystery away, and he tells us clearly about just who Jesus is. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, let's address a problem of language here so that we don't get confused. Jesus, as the firstborn of all creation, does not mean that Jesus is part of creation just as everything else has been created under heaven. It was a heresy in the early church that claimed that Jesus was higher than a human being, but he was a, he was a created being nonetheless, and the, the early church stamped that out pretty quickly. That is not what this verse is advocating. And based on what Paul goes on to say, we can conclude that the firstborn, the, the description that he uses here, has more to do with the idea of, being, of Jesus being the heir of all things, just like you know, in, in a human relationship, the firstborn son gets everything that the father Leaves to him, right? That's the same idea. He is the firstborn of all creation. That's the, the notion that this verse is trying to get across. In fact, it was through the pre-existed Jesus that all things came into being in the first place. For him, or rather for in him, all things were created, Paul tells us. Things in heaven and things on earth, things that are visible, things that are invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him 
and for him. Did you know that? This is the same idea that we find in the uh, opening verses, opening verse rather, I should say, of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In other words, everything, everything that exists came through the Word. In him was life, John continues to say, and this life was the light of all mankind. To summarize the truth of this teaching, Jesus is the creator of all that exists, whether on earth, whether in heaven, whether things visible, spiritual things that we can't see. And as creator, Jesus is also the sustainer. That is, the reason that all things exist as they do and continue to exist as they do is because Jesus Christ binds everything together. Is that a new understanding of Jesus for you? Never thought about Jesus in that way? The modern evangelical movement, the typical image of Jesus is that people tend to, to cling to and actually take a great deal of comfort in is that you know, Jesus is my buddy. Jesus is the, the, the friend of sinners. Jesus is the gentle lamb of God. And so we, we, in our mind's eye, picture Jesus you know, walking in a, in, a, in a shepherd's field holding a baby lamb, you know, taking care of that one lost sheep. And those are fine. Those are, those are fine images. They're not wrong. They're not inaccurate. But it seems to me that only seeing Jesus in that way limits the reality of who Jesus really is. He is the pre-existent one. He is the agent by which and for which the entire universe and everything in it has come into being and is, is withheld and upheld. He holds everything together, and thus the purpose of our lives is rooted in the relationship that we have and can have with Jesus Christ. How could it be otherwise if Jesus is exactly what we just described? Some people talk about a God-shaped hole. You ever heard about a God-shaped hole? I think there's a song that talks about a God-shaped hole. Maybe you can sing that for us next time. Just give you, plant some seeds in there for you. It's a God-shaped hole that exists in the human person that cannot be filled by anything else. People try to fill it with something else. In fact, they try to fill it with everything else. But because we have been created by Jesus and for Jesus, we will never experience the fulfillment of who we are and who we are created to be without that relationship with Jesus. We can see how Paul's Christology is meant to correct this misguided teaching that had crept into the Colossian church. Jesus is not just some great teacher who imparts spiritual wisdom. Jesus is the source of everything that exists and the goal towards which everything is moving. That's why we can read in the book of Revelation about Jesus as the judge of heaven and earth. He's over everything. And because he is, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's the end of the Bible, right? That's what we're looking forward to. People can bow now, willingly, or they can bow unwillingly, sometime in the future, but no one will be able to deny that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That is who Jesus is on what we might call the cosmic level. But now Paul goes into how Jesus enters into our lives on a more personal and intimate level. As creator, Jesus alone could provide the healing that was necessary for restoration. Paul begins to focus in on this rather grand picture that he has painted for Jesus, of Jesus. He has told us about the eternal nature of Jesus, being the author of the universe, but what does that mean for people like those in the church of Colossae? What does that mean for people like you and me? Well, verse 18 tells us, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. John's gospel told us that Jesus is life. Jesus is life itself in the sense that Jesus is the source of all life. They're all throughout the universe. Where does life come, come from? It comes from Jesus. And Paul takes this idea further in that Jesus is also the source of life for his church. Well, of course he is. In this context, the life of Jesus is not limited to the physical life that he lived on earth, but more importantly, to the resurrected life that the church shares with him because he has conquered physical death and he rose from the grave. 
That one thing that we, every single human being fears, Jesus conquered. He is the firstborn among the dead, Paul says. What this means is that in Jesus, the church has been given something that they didn't have before. It wasn't even possible to have before. In fact, what human beings had before Jesus was the opposite of life, which, of course, is death. Why is that? Because as Paul tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians, the taint of sin had corrupted the entirety of the human race, beginning with Adam. And because of that inherited sin nature, our ultimate end would be death. It was guaranteed. Nothing could be done about it from a human perspective. For since death came through a man, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, so the remedy for death must also come through a man. But the problem is, who could have provided such a remedy? Certainly not anyone who was born of Adam's race, of Adam's inheritance, and therefore shared in that same sin nature. You can't help it. You're born with it. What was needed was a different kind of man, a sinless man. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ provided for humanity. And accordingly, Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the death also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. It is the resurrected life, the second Adam of Jesus Christ, that he gives to the church. That's the kind of life that is sustaining to the church and gives it breath. And as a source of this life for the church, Paul can speak of that relationship. And really what we can see is organic terms. Christ is the head of the body. Not to be grotesque. But if you remove the head from the body, it dies. You need the head. The head guides, the head directs, the head sees and moves and directs other parts of the body. Moreover, the taint of sin affected all of creation, not just the human race. So if we think about it logically, who can restore or heal that which was broken other than the one who created it in the first place? The power to heal would be found only in Jesus Christ and nothing else. In whom all things were created, Paul says. Things in heaven, things on earth, things we can see, things we can't see. Jesus created it all. So when people talk about salvation and say things like, well, Christianity is fine for you, but I follow this other religion, and uh, that's, that's the thing that I place my trust in. Or that, you know, Jesus is, is okay, but, you know, there are many ways to get to God. And uh, if you found that way that works for you, good. Great, but I found my way. It's a little bit different than yours. When people say that, what that actually says is they have no idea what Scripture teaches. They have no idea who Jesus really is. There's a reason that Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Everybody, in any way you want, can come to the Father. It doesn't really matter. Did he say that? No, he doesn't say that. He says, no one comes to the Father but through me. Why does he say that? Is he just being exclusive? Is he trying to start a new religion? No. It's because he's the creator. And he was the only one who could heal humanity where it was broken. And therefore, he is the only way that salvation can happen. Humanity was broken out of fellowship with God. It had that sin nature. Nothing they could do about it. And Jesus offered the answer. He offered what was needed for that healing restoration to take place. So Paul can say, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That is how salvation happens. And if you take Jesus out of that picture, salvation doesn't happen. If you want to know what God is like, then all you need to do is look no further than the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the fullness of God dwells. And if you want to know how salvation is possible, then you need to look no further than the death of our Lord Jesus Christ for our sins on the cross. And quite honestly, what that tells me is that I don't care what Oprah says about salvation. I don't care what Lady Gaga says about salvation. I don't care what the culture says about salvation. The truth I follow and cling to comes from the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ revealed in the Gospels and taught through his apostles, through our scriptures. That's the teaching that I cling to. 
Notice that Paul has gone from the cosmic picture of Jesus to the more localized picture of Jesus in his descriptions of the church. And now he brings it down to an even more personal level. He says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now, in other words, things are different now, he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. It's a picture of healing. It's a picture of restoration and forgiveness, transformation. But there's a caveat. If you look at your, at your Bibles, they might represent this differently, but in mine there's a dash in between one sentence to the next. And that's the caveat. It says, you will be presented without blemish and free from accusation, dash, or dot, 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 if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Hold on to that. Stand firm on that, and don't move from it. That's what Paul's saying. Here we can see how Paul is admonishing the Colossian believers not to fall for any false teaching or ideas about Jesus. Stick to the truth that has been handed down to you. Do not move away from that, that firm foundation of faith that you have been given so far in your life of faith, continue in what you have received. This is the gospel, Paul says, that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You see, any other gospel other than the one that understands Jesus as the source and the means of salvation is actually no gospel at all. It's just another false teaching. And if these Colossian believers move away from that foundation and place their trust in something else, some other idea about Jesus that is not true at all, then they have no hope at all. Because everything comes down to what Jesus did for humanity. That is where our hope is placed. And by the way, that is still true for us today as well. If I, or if any other preacher or church, teaches anything other than the salvation that is possible through our Lord Jesus Christ, then I would advise you to get out of that church. Because that's not going to do you any good at all. It's going to take you farther away from God than to bring you closer to him. Jesus makes that clear in the Gospels, of course, and Paul has now reinforced that truth here in the, to the Colossian believers and for us. And as creator, Jesus alone could provide the healing that was necessary for our rest restoration. What Paul is reminding these believers is that the message of Jesus is truly good news. What they know about Jesus and his role in creation, as well as his role in their salvation, is something that past generations, quite honestly, didn't know about. There were hints of it. There were signs that perhaps pointed to it for some future possibility. But until the proper time, that truth about Jesus was something that had remained hidden. And now it is clearly available for all to see and for all to embrace for themselves. The mystery of salvation has been revealed in order that all people might have peace with God. Paul talks about what he has experienced primarily because he has been faithful in delivering the message of the gospel. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, he says, and I fill up my flesh in what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. In other words, Paul has experienced physical suffering, which includes beatings, it includes imprisonment. Why? Simply because he preaches the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to a world and in a world that is hostile to it. They don't like it, and they're against it, and they try to silence it. And yet, despite his afflictions, the gospel has reached the hearts reached the minds of many in this Colossian church. And as a result, many people have received salvation in Christ for themselves. That's what Paul's talking about here. The result is that Paul can rejoice and will gladly rejoice and continue to suffer if more people would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ through his preaching. He's okay with it. I'll take the beatings. I'll take the imprisonment. If you continue in your faith, if you continue to be faithful, and other people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and you tell other people about it. That's the work of the Lord, and that's something that Paul can rejoice in. But he's also rejoicing for another reason. In fact, in the mind of Paul, it is almost a miracle in his own right that he, of all people, should be the one who's bringing the gospel message to the Gentiles. 
He says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave to me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Paul, by his own admission, was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was from the right tribe, the, the, one of the best priestly tribes. He was a zealous proponent of the Jewish law. And on top of that, Paul was a Pharisee. We know about the Pharisees, don't we? And because he thought he was acting faithfully to God, he persecuted those people who were following in something called the way, this new teaching of the way, these people who followed this false teacher, this false prophet, Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah. Paul said, not a chance. That's false, and I'm going to persecute anybody who thinks otherwise. And that was what he was doing. And in doing so, he thought he was just simply protecting the Jewish faith and being faithful to God. Paul was wrong. It was on the Damascus Road where Paul personally encountered the risen Jesus who appeared to him and says, Saul, that was his former name, Saul, why do you persecute me? And of course, Paul has no idea about this. He says, who are you? And Jesus responds to Paul's question, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And Paul must have been confused because how was Paul persecuting Jesus? He didn't even know Jesus. And the answer is, when Paul was persecuting the people of the church, the body of Christ, in which Christ is the head, in effect, it was persecuting Jesus himself. That is the relationship that Jesus has with his church. That's the intimacy that Jesus has with the people of his church. And it was on the Damascus Road where Paul began to see how the mystery of Jesus, the mystery that had been hidden from past generations, was now fully revealed in the person of Jesus Christ, he could see it, and he understood it, and it all made sense. And from that moment on, Paul took a new identity. First of all, he took a new name. He went from Saul to Paul. He took on a new purpose. He took on a new passion in his life, which was to bring the good news of the gospel to the Gentile world. Think about that. A Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, zealous for the law, decides that he has a new mission and he's going to talk about salvation to Gentile people, non-Jewish people. Quite a transformation. It's the opposite direction from the direction that he was going. The same man who used to persecute those who believed in Jesus was now the man who would gladly bear the sufferings of Jesus in his own body for the sake of other people coming to know the truth about Jesus. Perhaps that is a miracle. The revelation of the mystery was now made to Paul, and Paul revealed that mystery to the Gentile people, and they in turn would reveal it to other people, and on and on it goes. It's a mystery, as Paul says, that has been kept hidden for all ages and generations, but is now disclosed by the Lord to the people. The mystery is God's saving purpose, which is not only for those of the Jewish nation that we read about all throughout the Old Testament, but for all those willing to trust in Jesus. And the Savior is none other than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ who shed his blood for the sins of the world and died on the cross for our redemption. That was the only way. And Jesus did it. Paul, as a Jew, was given this revelation of God's saving plan. And so as verse 27 says, to them, that is to those like Paul himself, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We might summarize the mystery by simply saying that Jesus died even for me and for you. Why would Jesus do such a thing? And the answer is because of love. Did you know that? Because of love. It's easy for us to say as a concept, but think about that. Jesus died for you because of love. Because he loved you. We all know what John 3.16 says. In fact, we're taught to memorize that at the earliest possible moment in the church. For God so loved only those people who had lives that were in perfect order and you know, didn't do anything wrong. That's not what it says. For God so loved the world. That means all people. Sinners though we were. And through the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ, all those who are willing can find forgiveness, can find restoration and peace with God. The salvation 
that only Jesus could offer. That is ours to have because it's been freely offered to us. And that is the message that Paul has, is privileged to proclaim as the one who has known that restoration and that forgiveness and that transformation in his own life. The mystery of salvation has been revealed in order that all people might have peace with God because that's what we want. Peace with God. This passage has contained a whole lot of what we can call Christology, which is just really nothing more than the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps it contains some things that you had never actually thought about, or maybe not really ever thought about before or considered. Things like Jesus as creator, Jesus as sustainer, or Jesus as the end goal of all things. But I hope that this message has given you clarity about why Jesus is the bedrock upon which our faith stands. Without Jesus, without his sinlessness, without his sacrificial death on our behalf, we are people who are without hope. We're stuck, and there's not a thing we can do about it. The hymn we occasionally sing is indeed true. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And Jesus Christ, the rock I stand, all other ground, sinking sand. Doesn't hold up. Paul's message to the church at Colossae, Paul's message to us and to all those willing to embrace it is that the mystery has been revealed. It is open to all who will receive it. Through faith in Christ, we can have peace with God. We can experience the joy of salvation. We can have the assurance that God no longer sees us as, as enemies defiled by the taint of sin, but holy in his sight. He sees us through the perfection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. Maybe we should have called the message that. It's all about Jesus. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. There it is. Let us not move from the hope that we find in the gospel. Let us rest firm on the foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for us as we too share the good news as we have received it. Like Paul, we have experienced it in our own lives and therefore we have something to share, something to tell with others, the work of God to be done. We can do that simply by telling what Jesus has done for us. Let us stand on that firm hope, the hope that we all share, that Jesus has opened the way and that we have an eternal hope. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for Paul's powerful words here. We know that your word is living and active and able, able to penetrate even to the deepest places of our hearts, places where nothing else can go, no surgeon's scalpel can get to. You can. And so we pray that your spirit would be active even now, transforming us inwardly, making us new creations in Christ. Even if we have been believers for decades, we know that our growing process is still a process. It's never completed. So help us to be mature and to grow in maturity that we might better serve you. Help us to stand on the truth that you revealed to us in our Bibles. And as we have already mentioned with the words of the hymn, our hope is built on nothing less in the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. We thank you for the free gift of salvation. Help us to worship and to praise you and to glorify you in all the things that we do and all the many aspects of our life. And we pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.